Thank you. The next item of business is a members' business debate on motion 2776 in the name of Craig Hoy on decommissioning of Torness nuclear power. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Craig Hoy to open the debate. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by welcoming colleagues from across this Parliament, from across the country, to this debate? While today's motion centres on the future of Torness nuclear power station in Dunbar, the benefits of Torness are felt right across Scotland and beyond. Torness started operating in 1988, and EDF Energy has recognised it as one of the most productive power stations in its fleet. Since it started generating safe, clean power, Torness has produced nearly 280 terawatt hours of zero carbon electricity. That is enough to power every single home in Scotland for 28 years. The station has provided many stable, high skilled, high paid jobs since construction began in 1980. And today, Torness is one of East Lothian's largest employers, with 500 staff, 250 contractors, and a salary bill totalling £40 million per year. That is £40 million and more through supply chain related jobs, which benefits families and the local and national economy. Torness has also provided much needed apprenticeships for an area where too many young people still have to travel uh, out with the county for training or skilled careers. Take the five new EDF apprentices who started last September. They will learn basic engineering skills in their first year before specialising in the trade in the second year. They will also get opportunities to gain life skills as part of the apprenticeship programme before completing the final two years back in Dunbar. And that is just one of the many positive benefits that Tornest State, uh, Power Station brings to the south of Scotland region. But as members will know, Tornest is set to be decommissioned in 2028, two years ahead of the original schedule. The decision to bring forward decommissioning results from analysis from other sites which, presided, uh, which provided EDF with a clearer picture of the lifetime expectations as the station ages. The station is operating normally and safely, but it is coming towards the end of its natural operational lifespan. And I would like to thank EDF for the undertaking that, wherever possible, early and advanced employee engagement will provide career development and reskilling opportunities for those who work at Torness. There will be no uh, hard cliff edge uh, of job losses in 2028, although redundancies and redeployment are still uh, likely to lie ahead. Just as happened at Hunterson B, jobs will start to taper off as defueling, uh, there's a defuelling process takes place before EDF hands over to Magnox to manage the full decommissioning process. And I give way to Mr Whitfield. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful um, for the member to give way. Would he agree with me that although the jobs that are there within Torness are safe beyond the closure date, the chance of future apprenticeships and the skills that those young people have learnt now are lost going forward because new apprenticeships won't be available after the closure. Craig Hoy. There is a very significant opportunity cost as the nuclear industry leaves the region uh, that I represent, and the opportunity for future skilled jobs will be undermined, undermined by the closure of Torness and the wider removal of the nuclear energy sector from Scotland. And so too, as Mr Whitfield says, will the opportunity to give East Lothian residents skilled jobs in uh, the nuclear uh, sector. And I'm sure if Mr McLennan is speaking, he will rightly say, but what about uh, renewables? And so did Friends of the Earth in a briefing yesterday. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, why can't we have both a future involving nuclear and renewables, a future which makes East Lothian the jewel in Scotland's energy crown, offering skilled and renewable energy jobs for now and into the future? Deputy Presiding Officer, I accept that the eventual closure of the present reactors at Torness was inevitable, but I do not accept that the end of the nuclear sector in Scotland is inevitable. I do not accept that the loss of the clean and stable energy supply which nuclear provides is inevitable. I do not accept that the loss of the skilled jobs in the sector is inevitable. And I do not accept that the loss of the economic benefits nuclear energy provides to East Lothian and Scotland is inevitable. Instead, they are the direct result of the SNP and Green Party's irrational hostility to nuclear energy. The coalition of chaos have got this wrong, and they have not even done the modelling to assess the economic impact of their actions. If we want to meet and exceed Scotland's net zero ambitions, 
then nuclear power must have a role to play. And I welcome the fact that East Lothian is now at the, front, the forefront of a significant renewables push. But renewables alone will not meet our requirements for stable, affordable, clean energy supplies throughout the transition period. The Government is driving North Sea oil and gas into the ground. So it is utter madness to turn our backs on nuclear energy at the same time. Absolutely. Deputy Presiding Officer, nuclear energy, energy is reserved, but the planning system is not. And the Scottish Government is using the planning system to scrap nuclear power by the back door. In doing so, it is setting itself on a mission to fail for its uh, net zero emissions target by 2045. Deputy Presiding Officer, I have still to hear a well-reasoned argument for Scotland rejecting nuclear energy. Let us be in no doubt the SNP Government's opposition to nuclear energy is playground politics at its worst. It is more about playing to the prejudices of the Greens than it is about achieving a safe, secure, sustainable and affordable energy supply. The SNP and the Greens' opposition to nuclear is the politics of the student union. The SNP has mis mistakenly conflated its misplaced attitude to nuclear energy with its misplaced attitude to nuclear defence. The tired old mantras about ban trident and Bairns not bombs are now influencing its views on energy. And for reasons known only to itself, this SNP government has sought to demonise the word nuclear, despite the safety and the security it provides to Scotland and the UK. And today of all days, where would we be if the SNP and the Greens had their way on energy or indeed on defence policy? Presiding officer, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government should reverse its short-sighted opposition to nuclear energy. My party will stand up for the nuclear industry. We will stand up for the jobs of those people working at Torness and the contribution it makes to the local economy. And I hope fellow members, including the member for East Lothian and his colleagues on the SNP benches, will rethink their position. I hope they will stand up for local jobs. I hope they will promote sustainable energy and drop their opposition to next generation nuclear energy in Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before I call the next speaker, I would remind all members who are seeking to speak in the debate that they need to press the request to speak button, not looking at anybody in particular. So I now call Paul McLennan uh, to be followed by Jamie Green. Up to four minutes, please, Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I thank Craig Coy for bringing forward this members debate this afternoon. I actually agree with much of what he's, he's said today so far. I mean, Torness has been one of the most, and I'll touch on other points that I don't disagree with them shortly. Torness has been one of the most productive stations in EDF's nuclear fleet, and it has contributed to the local economy. Of that, there's no doubt. I visited Torness after being elected in May, and indeed had visited previously when I was council leader. I've also had two additional meetings with the previous and new station managers. I've known and know many people who work at the station just now. I commend the, the contribution of Torness in terms of its electricity generation and its contribution to the local economy. What we need to ask now is, is what we need to do to ensure what is the best solution in terms of electricity generation and contribution to net zero and employability. Renewables produced the equivalent of 98.6 per cent of Scotland's electricity consumption in 2020, mostly from wind. The Scottish Government will bring forward an updated energy strategy, which I am sure the Cabinet Secretary will touch on in the spring, and it will be no surprise that this will not include a change in position on nuclear power. That has been made clear by the Cabinet Secretary and by the First Minister. This will be alongside a just transmission plan. I am also aware of the increasing interest in the development of new nuclear technologies, such as small modular reactors, which has been mentioned in the Chamber before. The Scottish Government, of course, will be duty-bound to assess new technologies and low-carbon energy solutions, and will continue to do so based on their safety case, value for consumers, and their contribution to Scotland's low-carbon economy and energy future. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Kerr. Encouraged, because what I think I have just heard the member say is that there is a possibility that uh, he and his party will support the deployment of small modular reactors. Because isn't it true, wouldn't the member agree that on this day of all days, on this day of all days, it is wrong to continue the demonization of nuclear as a word and as the source of clean energy? Paul McLennan. I wouldn't agree that I came out and said that I would support it. I said it would be duty bound. I think the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister have said that as, as well. And they remain doubtful, but they would look at it and they're duty bound to it. So that's not what I said. In 2016, Hinkley Point C nuclear power uh, plant received a contract for a different strike price of £92.50 uh, £92 per megawatt power, which has now increased by some 25% since then. 
In January of this year, the project was pushed back by a further six months, and its estimated cost increased by another £500 million. Recent power spike, uh, price spikes underline, uh, underline the need to create better outcomes from energy investments, particularly those struggling with household finances. Analysis has identified that in 2030 alone, Hinkley could add almost £40 a year to consumers' bills, whereas equivalent offshore wind could reduce it by £8. Significant growth in renewable storage hydrogen and in carbon capture are the best way in, in which just, just a second, to secure Scotland's future energy needs and to meet our net zero objectives. We have just heard in the Chamber earlier on today, indeed we heard earlier in the Chamber on NFNQs, that the UK SEC Climate Change recommended renewables-based energy as the best way of reducing exposure to volatile price rises. That was just announced today. I'll give way. Greg Hoy. Thank you. Just in case I might, but I thank the member for giving way. Just in case I might be preempting him, uh, he hasn't yet mentioned jobs. Has he yet grasped that it is the job of a member of parliament to come to this parliament and to defend jobs in his constituency, not to throw them under a bus? Paul McLennan. Of course I do. Yeah, of course I do. And I'll, I'll come on to that. I'll come on to that. The recent Scotland recent announcement of 17 new projects is, of course, extremely welcome. A total of just under £700 million will be paid to successful applicants and option fees and passed to the Scottish Government for public spending. There will also be multi-billion pound supply chain investment in Scotland, and I will touch on that later on. The potential power generated will provide for the expanding electrification of the Scottish economy as we move to net zero. And of course, once leasing agreements are officially signed, the details of the supply chain commitments made by the applicants as part of their supply chain development statements will be published. I have already met with SOWIC and Scottish Renewables on this issue already, and I will touch again on that in a little second. The recent Scottish Renewables supply chain impact statement revealed wind energy use could see its capacity increase by 200 and 31 per cent in the next eight years. This report also has found that the sector can triple in size by 2030. The sector already employs 23,000 people. The more established, long established offshore wind and hydropower industries are also worth £2.4 billion and £915 million respectively during 2019. So what do we do locally? On 18 March this year, I am convening a meeting of energy companies looking at the future of employment in the sector in East Lothian. The meeting will focus on skills and labour, supply chain development, manufacturing opportunities and community benefits. All the organisations I am going to, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, mention just now, I have met with individually. The following companies will be attending. Inchcape, Sea Green, which includes SSE and Total, EDF Renewables, Scottish Power, EDF Nuclear, Scottish Gas Network, Community Wind Power, Viridor, Skills Development Scotland, Department of Work and Pensionism, Scottish Enterprise, East Lothian Council, Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh College, Scottish Engineering, Scottish Renewables, Scottish Government and Unite. These will all be coming to the meeting on the 18th. But, Mr McLennan, I have been generous. I know you took yeah, some interventions, but we do need to yep. have other... I have taken a few interventions. Yes, I know, but yeah. we yeah. have time is moving on. I have given yeah. some latitude so, because of that. Please now bring your remarks to close. Yeah, Thank so, you. These will be the series of meetings looking at the opportunities that renewables will bring directly to you. Then. Every, every worker who wished to stay EDF with uh, Arne Arnston remained with the company. Every single one car, worker. In conclusion, President Officer, the transition to renewables offers East Lothian many opportunities. It offers opportunities in increased employment, supply side development, manufacturing opportunities and community benefits. As the East Lothian constituency MP, I am clear that this transition needs to be managed well and requires constant engagement with all. I am already doing that and will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now call Jamie Green to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Green. Uh, thank you. Can I thank Craig Hoy for this debate? It's allowing members who have had or hosted nuclear energy facilities in their region to participate, not just East Lothian, of course, but Hunterson B Power Station in my West Scotland region. Uh, it wasn't entirely uncontroversial in its origin, we should be honest, but it has grown to be a great source of both debate and pride for the people of North Ayrshire in equal measures over the years. But whatever your personal or political views, it undoubtedly has led the charge in delivering reliable, low-carbon and cost-effective power to homes right across Scotland and beyond. It first opened in 1976, and that plant has provided 46 years of energy generation and employed hundreds, if not thousands, of jobs directly and indirectly and important apprenticeships. I think we all owe them all, every single worker there, a huge debt of gratitude because they and their families were welcome, and they and their families have become a fabric of the community and society in my region. At its peak, this power station could provide enough energy to power 1.7 million homes. And over its lifespan, Hunterson B has saved 224 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions over traditional carbon energy creation. Now, of course, members will know that cracks did start to appear in the reactors in recent years, and that rightly caused concerns. I was the first 
to hold regular meetings and calls with civic agencies, the plant, its owners and local community interest groups who all had concerns. But its doors have now closed and the defuelling process will commence, at which point the plant will be handed to the Nuclear Decommission Authority. But whilst we are losing this facility, I really think there is an exciting potential on the horizon here, and it is there that I want to focus my brief comments. North Ayrshire Council, along with partners at the University of Glasgow, the private sector and others, are currently bidding to host the UK's first nuclear uh, fusion facility in Ardeer near Ardrossan yeah. through the UK's STEP programme. This is a bid that I and I hope these benches and I hope other benches will uh, support as well. Now, we've all received briefings, I'm sure, in advance of this debate, which uh, slightly diminish, I think, the importance of nuclear technology, modern nuclear te technology, towards our efforts towards carbon zero. I respect people's views on that, but what makes the Ardeer bid so different is that it will operate using nuclear fusion rather than nuclear fission. And this is the key. When fission creates energy by splitting nuclei into smaller particles, fusion does exactly the opposite. Effectively, hundreds of millions of tiny reactions every second can provide a massive amount of energy, with very small amounts of fuel actually used. That sounds technical, but it's important because fusion is efficient, it's safer, and it's cleaner. It's also cheaper, Cabinet Secretary. One kilogram of fusion fuel, fuel could provide the same amount of energy as 10 million kilograms of fossil fuel. Just think about that for a second. Because by 2050, the world will be using twice as much electricity as it is today. Uh, we know that populations are rising. We know that living standards generally are rising. But so does the amount of energy that we use rises. We must ask ourselves a very simple question. How on earth are we going to provide for those energy needs? And given the current events, it really reminds us of the fragility of that supply, gas in particular. Uh, prices were on the rise, and I have no doubt will be on the rise further. Now, it's all very well extolling the uh, sanctions on energy companies in one part of a debate in this parliament, but then bemoaning the energy crisis and the cost of living in another. Now, both are viable arguments, but viable solutions must equally be found. And, uh, I, I'm really short on time. I do apologise. I, I, I wish I had more time. Now, I'm not advocating that nuclear is the only source of energy. No one doubts the importance of renewables uh, in Scotland. It's one of our environment's great assets. But the reality is we're simply not there yet, Deputy Presiding Officer. Renewables alone simply cannot and will not fulfil all our energy needs right now. Electricity perhaps in the future, but gas less so. We're still using it, we still need it, so we either extract it or we buy it. Now, I just feel like, and I want to mention this, because there's a real lack of interest uh, and enthusiasm from the centre benches, not just in North Ayrshire, but right across Scotland. There is a lack of strategy for bringing these so-called green jobs yeah. on the ground. Where are the jobs that will replace the people who work at Hunterston? I, I want to cement Scotland's reputation as being at the forefront of scientific excellence. Let's make progress towards net zero. Let's make progress towards uh, rejuvenating Mr. our Mr Green, economy. could you please, please bring your marks to close? And let's secure our energy supply <clears throat> first and foremost. Let's not look back at this as a missed opportunity, Cabinet Secretary. Please listen to our requests. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Liam Kerr. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Craig Hoy for bringing this member's debate today on such a, an important aspect, both from... East Lothian, the south of Scotland, but also for energy provision across Scotland. As we heard, Torness was began to be built in 1980, but first started generating power only eight years later in 1988. And it has been one of the most productive plants in the fleet, generating enough zero carbon electricity, the zero carbon that we're all striving for, to power every single house in Scotland for 28 years. But it is now working beyond its original expected 25 to 30 year design life. These are designs from the 70s. It's like going on holiday and hoping you don't get an old fashioned Boeing 747 that's been riveted together. And it is a tribute, not only to the 550 EDF staff on site, plus the 180 full time additional staff that are there, but it is also a tribute to the skills and the knowledge of those who are in charge, both at EDF and above, in those that enforce the regulations over our civil nuclear feet. Electricity production will end in 2028, following inspection, modelling 
and operational experience gained from across the United Kingdom and indeed further. The decisions that are taken are being based on evidence and knowledge, but founded in the requirement for safety. It was a tribute to Jamie Green for his tribute to Hunterston B and the information that was learnt during the cycle of that fleet on it, because safety lies at the heart of the nuclear power industry and has done from day one. And that is why, to convolute the nuclear power for the production of electricity, safe zero carbon electricity, with that of nuclear weapons, is really to do a disservice to a highly skilled industry. And talking of the skills in the industry, I would like to spend a short moment congratulating Lisa Hilferty, who at 26 was named the station's Apprentice of the Year last year, after four years of skilled training. Along with Lisa, Murray Gilvery, Conrad McNeil, Thomas Somerville and Paige Gould, all qualified as apprentices, now able to take those skills and trade around the world. If it's short. Sorry, uh, Jamie Sorry Green. Sorry, Jamie apologies. Green. Thank you, Zerring Austin. Thank you, Member. I, I know you haven't got much time, but the problem is, is that the replacement for those apprenticeships, if, if the government's policy is no to nuclear per se, then they must have something else to offer those young people. And the problem is, at the moment, it simply doesn't exist. Martin Whitfield. Absolutely, and that's why I took the opportunity to pay tribute to those apprentices who've been through a highly skilled course around the whole of the UK, not actually supported by the Apprenticeship Fund because they were travelling to England for part of their training, but shows the commitment of EDF to the young people and to going forward. The closure of Torness will mean a shortfall in the capacity, and this has to be filled. And in part, and in all probability, it's going to be filled from the open global market from gas and from places such as Russia. And this is going to prevent more ambitious emission reductions that will threaten Scotland and the UK energy security going forward. I know time is short, but I very quickly want to pay tribute to the CNC, the Civil Nuclear Constabulary, who have protected our nuclear fleet and do so in some of the worst conditions that the weather can throw at them. And they do so to keep us, to keep our plants, the fleet safe, but most important, to keep energy security here in the UK. And nuclear power needs to play a part in that zero carbon future. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you. I now call Liam Kerr to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to make a very small contribution regarding the final part of Craig Hoy's motion, where he calls on the Scottish Government to review its blocking of any future civilian nuclear energy projects in Scotland. Uh, Marie Todd, MSP set out the Scottish Government's position in the John O'Groats Journal last week. She rejected nuclear power as she said it is high cost to consumers over other options, is high risk in terms of safety and is not sustainable. She went on, we must focus on reliable energy sources that align with our net zero ambitions. I believe that the renewables plan as set out in the Scottish energy strategy offers just that. Now, not unusually, when stress tested, her arguments lack foundation. She is apparently unaware that the Scottish Government confirmed to me earlier this month that it has no strategic transition plan from Scottish generated nuclear energy to renewables. And how she knows that nuclear doesn't align with our net zero ambitions is extraordinary, given that the Cabinet Secretary told me it is not currently possible to distinguish between types of generation or fuels in order to break down CO2 emissions data from energy generation sources in Scotland. And as Craig Hoy flagged, the Scottish Government won't replace Torness and Hunterston, yet has done no modelling of the impact on energy bills and the cost of living crisis. So her cost claims are spurious at best. And finally, Marie Todd justified her position by stating, I believe the vast majority of the public back my position. I respectfully suggest she reviews some YouGov research published in the run-up to COP26, which shows in Scotland 65% are in favour of a role for nuclear in the energy mix, with 13% against and 20% don't know. She also said nuclear was high risk in terms of safety, yet there have been no major nuclear safety incidents in the UK industry's 46 years. And anyone who has done their homework knows all current operating stations have extraordinary levels of built-in redundancy. 
And new reactors are designed with even higher levels of safety built in, with further enhancements as the technology has moved on, all whilst being subject to one of the most robust regulatory regimes in the world. Next, on the economics over other options. The price of power from Hunterson B until it retired and Torness is about £45 pound per megawatt hour. Wind contracts for difference historically average around £90 to £100 pound per megawatt hour and have only recently reduced to similar levels to Torness. In terms of build cost, the UK government's proposed regulated asset base model will lower the cost of financing, which Paul McLennan will be delighted to hear uh, the National Audit Office is saying would have reduced Hinkley's costs by 40%. In addition, wind turbines only operate 25 to 40% of the time. When they're not operating without nuclear, the grid has to use expensive gas to fill the void. Nuclear stations operate more than 90% of the time, re requiring far less backup. And finally, President Officer, on the waste, bear in mind the nuclear industry is the only one to pay for and clean up its own waste. EDF and the UK government have already set aside £14.8 billion to decommission and dispose of waste from the existing power stations. And an increasing fund, equivalent to about £2 per megawatt hour, has been created to cover the cost. The amount of waste produced by nuclear is also very small. Almost all radioactivity is in a tiny fraction of the waste called high-level waste. Over the lifetime of the station, there is one dishwasher tablet worth of such waste for every person in the UK. So, President Officer, a short contribution to this debate, but one which I think is necessary, if only to add some scientific and data-driven fortitude to a Scottish Government position, which is anything but. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Paul uh, Sweeney, uh, who will be the last speaker before the Cabinet Secretary responds. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Sweeney. I think uh, members in the Chamber have illustrated the challenge that Scotland faces with energy in future. With Scotland using more nuclear power than any other UK nation in 2020 at 26%, the forthcoming ending of generation at Torness and the already uh, cessation of generation at Hunterston B this year presents a significant challenge to the resilience of Scotland's electricity grid. And given that the country will need four times as much clean power by 2050 to hit net zero, according to the Climate Change Committee, and 38 per cent of that clean power needing to be from firm, reliable, always-on power sources, regardless of weather conditions, we are faced with a stark choice – reliance on gas or the utilisation of new generation nuclear stations, whether in Scotland or in other parts of the United Kingdom. It is as simple as that. Therefore, we are presented with a choice, and I don't think the choice simply is the non-secure presented by other members, such as Hinkley Point to see. I'm not a fan of the European pressurised water reactor technology. I think it's a dog of a design and deeply uh, problematic, and actually is a symptom of the domination of the British nuclear industry by the French state. However, we have other opportunities presented to us, not just to look at new technologies, but to build an industrial renaissance in Scotland by being at the forefront of the energy industry. The father of nuclear physics, Sir Ernest Rutherford, in 1933, mentioned that the energy produced by breaking down the atom is a very poor kind of thing. Anyone who expects a source of power from transformation of these atoms is talking moonshine. We hope in the next few years to get some idea of what these atoms are, how they are made, and the way they are worked. Even Rutherford's statement illustrates how, how great minds can fail to anticipate the evolutionary direction of their own discoveries. The con conversion of matter into energy, like all scientific discoveries, can be used for good or for ill, and it is for us to make the right choices. New types of nuclear reactors have significant potential to improve safety, reduce waste and reduce cost. These are the three principal threats to public acceptance of nuclear power generation. This opens up the prospect of making an important contribution to the strategy for future emissions reduction, and Scotland should support the development of such nuclear power technology. Nuclear generation has very low CO2 footprint, but most existing nuclear plants are not suitable for coping with variations in grid demand and cannot contribute to restarting the system after a grid failure because the presence of the grid is required as a prerequisite for the reactor to start up. So we should seek to design nuclear plants that are more commercially competitive, reliable, flexible and exploit inherently passive safety 
features that can contribute very significantly to capital cost reduction. These ambitions seem to be a tall order, but new fourth generation reactor technologies should be able to deliver such a vision. One example, molten salt reactors are designs that are now showing great prominence in a number of countries. These designs have the potential to achieve large cost savings by removing the hazards that could lead to explosive release of dangerous fission products into the atmosphere. In the hierarchy of approaches to safety engineering, hazard elimination, varm reduction and likelihood or mitigation of consequences of the hazard itself normally proves to be the most cost-effective strategy. And that is where technologies like molten salt come into their own. There are other favourable features of molten salt reactors, including the salt and steel corrosion problems are eliminated by chemical reducing properties in the coolant formulation. Refueling can be carried out on load and unpressurised, further reducing capital cost. Maintenance of long-lived radioactive waste is much easier and cheaper since the radioactive waste with very long half-lives is converted into much shorter half-life isotopes. A range of fuel types can be used. For example, thorium fuel has the potential to be used when uranium reserves begin to run out. And the UK legacy stock of plutonium can be used for new fuel production. And reuse of plutonium as fuel would have immense strategic value as a contribution to removing and reducing proliferation of potential weapons material. Molten salt reactors can also be factory produced as road transportable modules. So there is a potential utilisation of new technologies that can build a supply chain in Scotland that would actually crowd in wealth and opportunity. And if the nuclear industry had not evolved from military imperatives, and had developed independently, molten salt technology now under development would probably be regarded as a dream contribution to the challenges of reliability and carbon reduction for the electricity system. That is the opportunity to be presented with if we reassess fundamentally what nuclear energy can present for this country. And I urge the Cabinet Secretary to broaden his horizons and consider these emerging fourth generation technologies. Scotland can be in the lead on this globally and we should seize that opportunity. Thank you. I now call on Cabinet Secretary Michael Madison to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Sign Officer. And can I congratulate Craig Coy on securing time for this important debate on what is a, an important facility in, Scot uh, in Scotland at Torness and the power it's provided to Scotland for uh, more than 30 years and will continue, obviously, to do so for the, uh, uh, for the next couple of years. And I recognise the very valuable role that the workforce have provided over uh, many decades and the important role that it plays within the uh, East Lothian uh, community, points which were highlighted by uh, Craig Coy himself, by uh, Paul McLennan and also by Martin Whitfield in their contributions. Uh, clearly, it's a facility which has now uh, set a time frame for uh, the period to come offline and to move into decommissioning phase. Uh, and a key part of the work which will be taken forward in the course of that is through Scottish Government agencies working in partnership with the uh, National Decommissioning Agency to look at what support and assistance can be provided to the workforce as it transitions away from being a nuclear facility to uh, other opportunities. However, um, of course, as we are now at the point where this is a facility which is now planning to come offline in 2028, we need to consider whether Scotland's electricity supply remains secure as a result of that loss of output. That is why the National Grid uh, conducted a detailed study into the effects of the earlier uh, decision to end production at Torness. As a result of the closure of that particular facility, the study from the National Grid, who are responsible for ensuring the security of supply, is that Scotland's system remains secure uh, with some mitigations that need to be put in place, a key part of which is including increasing our own capacity. In addition, let me make a bit of progress first of all. In addition, uh, our own energy sector has been in transition for some time now. Uh, we are very clear as a government our priorities are renewables, uh, storage, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage which we believe provide the best pathway to Scotland reaching its net zero target by 2045. And we have been making very good progress in taking that forward over recent years, particularly with the expansion of greater renewable capacity. We now have the equivalent around of around 98% of our electricity now coming from renewable sources. And we want to build on that and develop that further as we progress further forward. 
In addition, uh, in yeah, I'll give way to Mr. Kerr. Liam Kerr. I'm not entirely convinced by some of the statistics that we've just heard, but going back to the point about National Grid, does the Cabinet Secretary not recognise that all of National Grid's future energy scenarios include nuclear? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. In, in relation to the UK, yes, it does, but not here in Scotland in terms of security of supply, which is what the study specifically uh, addressed. Uh, can, I, can I just say to the member, because I, I hear from a, a secretary position, as ever with Mr uh, Kerr, um, um, questioning uh, details in these matters. In relation to the, the 98 per cent, where exactly does he think that figure came from? It comes from the assessment through the National Grid. Let me just give you some of the details. Scotland currently is a net electricity exporter and in 2020 exported 20.4 terawatt hours of electricity, the equivalent of powering every household in Scotland for 26 months. Scotland imported a little over one terawatt hour in 2020, meaning that the net export from, uh, of electricity from Scotland is 19.3 terawatt hours in 2020 alone, a record high level, a reflection of the investment which has been made into our renewable energy sector, which is why it is a priority for us going forward. And that's why we are very fortunate as a country to be in a position where we have such extensive potential to develop our renewable sector. And that's why it's important we build on that and we make progress on that, because it will not only help to decarbonise Scotland, it will help to decarbonise the UK and beyond. I'll give way to Mr Hoy. I, th I thank the Minister for giving away. Just for clarity and to address the point that Marie Todd said, does the Minister believe that nuclear power, particularly the station at Torness, is safe? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I do accept that it's a safe uh, facility and there's a very strict regime around that. However, I think it's also wrong to try and give the impression that there is no risk associated with nuclear power. Uh, uh, Fukushima, uh, took place, Fukushima took place in 2011, uh, not that long ago. So we need to be mindful of the risks which are also associated with it. It's not risk-free. But it is a excuse very me, uh, excuse safe, me, Cabinet, uh, Could you resume your seat for a second? Uh, there's far too much sedentary pension. Mr Hoyt, you intervened in the Cabinet Secretary. He gave you an answer, and then you, from a sedentary position, you continued. That's not the way to do it. Seek another intervention or listen to what the Cabinet Secretary says. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary. So I hope I've, referred, I've, I've answered the, uh, the member's point. Let me also just point to uh, the, the outcome from uh, Scotland and the first phase of Scotland, where the uh, the approach has been taken by Crown Estate Scotland demonstrates an ambition from the sector to deliver some 25 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, uh, across uh, Scottish waters, something which is, uh, I think is a real testament to their confidence in the approach that the Scottish Government is taking in investing and in supporting our renewable sector, and to make sure that we also secure the jobs and the benefits that can come uh, from that. I also want to turn to this issue around the idea about the cost impact of the, the nuclear sector. If we set aside the, the waste and the environmental concerns, uh, nuclear power is well recognised as being poor value for customers. It is an expensive form of electricity to produce. The evidence that was provided by the, uh, the contract awarded by the UK Government to Hinkley Point C, which Paul McClellan made reference to, is that the price for generating is £92.50 £92 per megawatt hour. You compare that with the electricity that is generated from offshore wind, it is currently at £39.65 per megawatt hour. And the assessment is that, under the UK's forward look in future generation, is that the cost in 2030 each household bill as a result of Hinkley Point is potentially £40 in addition to the cost as a result of that programme alone, whereas the equivalent of offshore wind, it would actually be £8 less per year. I will give way to Mr Kerr, who can stand on his feet this time and ask a question. Stephen Kerr. Very pleased to take the opportunity to stand on my feet and ask a question. Paul McLennan raised the prospect that uh, you, Cabinet Secretary, in your duties as uh, responsible for, for energy, would, would consider with an open mind the possibility of small modular reactors? Because some of the issues you've been discussing are addressed 
through the, the deployment of small modular reactors. We've heard some excellent speeches on the engineering and science behind all this, but, but, but there's a real potential benefit in SMR. Will he look at this with an open mind as a benefit for Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the reality is that small modular reactors are a, it's a change in construction type, but the technology is by and large the same on a smaller scale. Uh, and as we have set out in our energy strategy, under existing technologies, we do not support new nuclear energy provision. And that's the difference. That's the, the, although there's a, a change in terms of scale and nature of its construction, in terms of the principle of the nuclear, yet yeah, the nuclear process, it remains the same. And it's not a new technology in that sense. I'll give way, I think, to Mr. Well, Sweeney. Paul Sweeney. Would, would the Cabinet Secretary uh, accept? as I outlined in my speech, that the transformational effects of such technologies as molten salt can introduce passive safety, so it's actually a revolutionary change in how the nuclear industry would operate, massively reducing the capital cost of stations. And even looking at the supply chain, Rolls-Royce are interested in building a heavy pressure vessel factory in the UK, £200 million of investment. Uh, your, your colleague, um, the uh, member for Glasgow province, said he hasn't even met with the company to discuss the prospects that have been located in Scotland. That's a supply chain opportunity, heavy engineering, advanced manufacturing. Could that at least be something the Cabinet Secretary should consider taking up proactively with Rolls Royce? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I'm sure uh, Ivan McKee will, um, uh, will respond to the particular point in terms of uh, pursuing anything with Rolls Royce uh, through uh, inward investment. But the position of the Scottish Government in terms of uh, the existing technologies which are available for uh, fission nuclear energy uh, are not consistent with our energy policy, and that will not change under the review of our existing energy strategy. And that includes uh, the small reactors that the member made reference to. I thought that it was an interesting point that, uh, that Liam Kerr made, and that was in relation to the, the costs uh, which are associated with the, the decommissioning of uh, nuclear energy. He made reference to the very significant amount of money which EDF have set aside to cover nuclear decommissioning. Who does he think has provided that money? It's us, customers. We have provided that money through our bills. The cost of decommissioning isn't something which is picked up by the companies in some philanthropic approach. It is actually based into the cost and it's added on to our bills as a result. So to try and give the impression as though decommissioning is something that's picked up on by the commercial companies alone is factually incorrect because it is met by the additional cost that is put on to customers' bills. And that's why, that's why it is a poor deal for the taxpayer. Even if you take somewhere like Hunterston A, which stopped producing electricity back in 1990, it has still gone through its decommissioning process. The cost of that is fixed into people's household bills. And that's why the costs of nuclear energy are well recognised as not being good value for customers. And that's why the Scottish Government's focus is on making sure that we invest in renewable energy, we make sure we make the best use of Scotland's natural assets, and to make sure we do that in a way which is consistent with Scotland reaching net zero by 2045. Thank you very much, Deputy Design Officer. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this session until 2.30 uh, p.m. this afternoon.